So, you want to rock 128 gigabytes of memory in your new AM5 platform. Well, I've got the best kit of memory to do that. Well, I've got the best kit of memory to do that if you want to rock 64 gigabytes, not 128 gigabytes. That is the Trident Z Neo F5 6000J 3040 G32 GX2 TZ5NR. G Skill, we, we got to really work on these names. Like RGB DDR5 Neo V2, V3, something. But these are two 32 gig sticks of memory. It is the most impossible task to ask the AM5 memory controller, or at least in the 7950X or the 7900X. 128 gigs is a challenge on this platform if you want to run the memory really fast with low latency. Let's talk about my experiences. Okay, first up, easy stuff out of the way. AM5, even if you're an experienced computer builder, AM5 and DDR5 pretty much necessitates that the DIMM slots are a little bit different. You see, in the olden days, the memory slots had pins that would solder all the way through the printed circuit board. And because you had metal going through this, you know, laminated copper and, you know, printed circuit board material, um, it was pretty mechanically strong. That's not the case anymore. The pins are much, much smaller in their surface mount, which means that they're connected only to the very top layer of copper. And there's really not as much mechanical strength holding the DEMS in. Now, ASRock for theirs, they've got some mechanical supports that go all the way through the printed circuit board, you know, at the bottom and top of the slot, as well as the middle where the divider is. Things are a little different on the Aorus side of things. There's holes for that there, but I can't really feel the pins go all the way through. So maybe things are a little different in terms of how they're put together. Or maybe it's a different brand of slot. You know, this one is, a, is uh, you know, it's all plastic. There's not even any metal reinforcement here. So maybe that's the difference. And they were, they were trying to decide which one goes where. So you got to be careful when you're inserting the memory. The other thing is that it's a little more resistive, meaning that when you put the dim in, it wants to fight you a little bit more. And as you're putting it in, rocking it back and forth, if you don't have good manual dexterity, will be really hard on the slot and could fatigue the plastic. So when you insert it, you know, in the olden days, you would push down and it might click into place. But I found with modern DDR5, you have to give it, you have to sort of push down on it and help it click into place. If you have a lot of experience building computers, it can kind of poison the well a little bit because you're used to when you push the memory in, the little tabs snap into place automatically. With a lot of the motherboards that I've put memory into, that hasn't been the case. It feels a little different and it will click, but it doesn't click all the way into place. You see, having two DIMMs per memory channel, two DPCs, what that's called, creates a lot of uh, electrical and logistical problems for the integrated memory controller. The memory controller in the CPU has a lot more to juggle keeping up with two DIMMs on the same set of wires. That's what it means, two DIMMs per channel. Uh, a lot of those wires are shared between those two slots. And so when the memory controller gives a set of commands to one DIMM, it can switch to the other DIMM and ask it to do something and then switch back to the first DIMM and see if that operation has completed or the memory timings will let it estimate when that'll be completed and then it's able to connect to the memory and actually transfer things over the bus and blah blah blah. The reality though is that it seems like two DIMMs per channel is a little bit more of a challenge on AM5 than it has been historically. Not only that but there's also this idea of ranks. So this is a dual rank DIMM meaning that there's two ranks of 16 gigabytes of memory on this single stick for a total of 32 gigabytes. And the way that the memory controller addresses two physical sticks is pretty much the same, almost exactly the same, as the way the memory controller addresses two ranks on a single stick of memory. So even though this is two DIMMs per channel, we have four ranks per channel that we're dealing with. And that's why on the AM5 platform, it's a little sketchy. I'm telling you that because if you don't have your memory inserted perfectly, absolutely perfectly, it's not gonna work at all, or your computer's gonna be stuck dealing with shenanigans for a long time. So if you have problems, try reseeding your memory. Now, in addition to this 
G Skill kit that I have, I've ordered a ton of other memory kits. Corsair Dominator Platinum, 5200 gigabytes. Pretty good stuff when you're gonna rock 64 gigabytes and oh, 5200 is too slow. Yeah, if you're just gonna rock two dims, you could get away with 6000, but 5200 is not bad. Team Group, we've got the T-Force Delta RGB. This is running at, at 6000, of course. I also have several Trident Z kits that are not Expo. These are XMP ready. And also Kingston Fury and a couple other kits. A-Data is mixed in here. So there's a lot of different options. AM5 is currently, because it's a new platform, I think, uh, even more temperamental about mixing kits of memory. Even two different uh, G-Skill Trident Z kits of memory. I definitely would not recommend that. For this video, getting 128 gigabytes working, I'm using two of the exact same kit. So it's a best possible scenario. They're Expo kits, best possible scenario. DDR5 6000 with not super insane timings, you know, 30, 40, 40, 96, 1.4 volts. Eh, it's up the upper end of voltage for DDR5, but okay, we'll get it done. It's fine. I've also got pretty good representation of motherboards from MSI, ASRock, ASUS, and Gigabyte. The good news is, from all of the testing, that all of these motherboards had pretty much the same capabilities in terms of running 128 gigabytes of memory. The bad news is that you're not going to be running DDR5-6000 in pretty much any scenario with any of these boards, even with a perfectly matched kit of DDR5 memory. It's just not there yet. This kit of memory has been available at retail for a little while now. I was sort of hoping that BIOS updates would improve what I had initially experienced. And it's gotten better, don't get me wrong, but it's still not super amazing. The other bit of good news is that with all of these motherboards, just plugging in the memory and turning it on, the system will post. You will get to BIOS. It may be a little unsettling because it does take north of 10 minutes for some of these boards. Most of them, I'd say the average is about five, but it does work. The bad news is that when it posts, it's running at DDR5 3600. Now remember, AMD's official supported memory table starts and then backs off when you've got two DIMMs per channel and dual rank. It's the worst case scenario. And things improve, you know, when we're talking about Ryzen 5000, running four sticks of memory on your Ryzen 5000 platform was a heck of a lot better than the 2000 series, than the 1000 series from AMD. The 1000 series really, I think everybody can agree, was a little sketchy when it first launched in terms of memory support. You really had to dial it in and get it just right. I think AM5 is a little better than that, but it's still really new. And so if you're gonna run 128 gigabytes of memory, you're probably not going to get the most memory bandwidth or the best memory latency. Now this is a little surprising because even on the AM4 platform in the Ryzen 2000 generation, you could at least get better memory throughput because you have more DIMMs to keep busy. The memory controller would do a little bit better job keeping the memory kits busy. Well with two, of our DDR5-6000 kits running, of course, at DDR5-6000 because it'll it'll run. That's actually pretty good. Dual rank on two DIMM, 64 gigabytes. That's a lot more stress on the controller, the memory controller, than 32 gigabytes. DDR5-6000 worked fine on all of these boards. It worked well. And we were getting, you know, 70-ish gigabytes per second in ADA64 with a reasonable memory latency. When I switched to four DIMMs, and we, you know, we're running the out-of-the-box defaults with that, the memory latency was closer to 93 nanoseconds, but our memory bandwidth was only about 50 gigabytes per second. That's really odd. Now I did do some tuning and experimentation, and in one not perfectly stable configuration, I was getting 91 gigabytes per second, which is the best score that I've ever seen on any AM5 platform. It was also a little bit of a wrinkle juggling the iGPU. So you could actually detect visual artifacting from the iGPU when things were not exactly perfectly stable. Now I used A to 64 and MemTest 86 to do memory testing. A to 64 is pretty good if you're in Windows and you want something to test in Windows, but if you have a lot of instability, Windows is going to corrupt itself and then you're gonna be reinstalling Windows. So maybe not the best way to test system stability. Whereas you can boot from a USB stick and run MemTest 86. That is a great way to test and catch instability as well. The bottom line for me though, with our one 7950X test CPU that we tested all of these in, is that if I disable the iGPU, I seem to be able to drive four sticks of memory at a higher rate a little bit better. That kind of makes sense, and it kind of doesn't. Now because 
I'm talking about 128 gigabytes on a 16 core platform, I think you're using that more for work than play. So if we're in a situation where it's a little bit more unstable with the iGPU and perhaps a little bit less unstable uh, without the iGPU, then I kind of don't want to run it even with the iGPU disabled. Like I'm not saying that's a concession. I'm saying that there's something weird going on with the platform that probably needs to be investigated or don't expect to really be able to run things beyond DDR5 3600. So what if you do want to push the envelope and actually run faster than DDR5 3600 because you know you'll boot up with DDR5 4800 with just you know two sticks of memory and then you can set DDR5 6000 and everything's basically pretty good, right? Uh, it varied. So 3800 to 4200 was possible with all of these boards. But again, I don't know about the stability. Like I wouldn't really recommend it necessarily because if you're building a system with 128 gigabytes of memory, stability. If you want something for gaming and you want the lowest possible latency and the highest bandwidth and everything else, then I really, really recommend you stick with 64 gigabytes of memory for now. Don't go for 128 gigabytes. Theoretically, we may see DDR5 DIMMs that are 64 gigabytes each, and then the story may change. But for now, I don't really recommend four DIMMs for 128 gigabytes. Can you infer that that means that four DIMMs of 64 gigabytes is also pretty bad? I would say technically no, but as a practical matter, yes. As a practical matter, yes, because AMD literally tells us that in their specifications, four DIMMs or two DIMMs per channel, it's gonna run slower. But also, this is, you know, pretty significant reduction in uh, available bandwidth. I mean, 50 gigabytes per second with four DIMMs versus 70 gigabytes per second with two DIMMs, that's really weird and I think merits further investigation. For memory experimentation, I do have to give a shout out to MSI. MSI's memory try it feature was invaluable for this testing. It is by far the easiest thing to, you know, try different memory <laughs> configurations and see which one works and see which one doesn't. Um, ASRock and Gigabyte have a great facility for clearing your CMOS, at least with these boards, that works, that works pretty good. ASUS also has a feature in their BIOS that lets you uh, load presets for different non-Expo kits of memory. That's really nice. That doesn't exactly solve the problem that we have here, but that feature is pretty awesome, especially if you're gonna run a non-Expo kit, because it says, here is how we can deal with 2x16 gigabytes of Hynix. Here's how we can deal with 2x16 gigabytes of Samsung. The problem is that none of the presets deal with 4x32 gigabytes of DIMMs. 2x32 gigabytes, sure. 4x16 gigabytes, sure, not 4x32 gigabytes. This is maybe a little disappointing overall because DDR5 on the Z690 and Z790 platform from Intel is a little better. Now the performance difference on AM5 between one DIMM and two DIMMs per channel left me scratching my head a little bit. I, I thought this was better with DDR4 on you know, the AM4 platform, or even better on the Intel platform. So I decided to take a look at Z790 and our ASRock Taichi Carrera, and also the MSI Z790 Godlike, which have improved memory compatibility. Now for DDR5 7000, the 13900K memory controller can clear 106 gigabytes per second in our ADA64 memory benchmark and beat the AM5 memory latency. I'm not so surprised that it beats the memory latency, but I'm surprised the memory bandwidth is so much higher. But this is two 32 gig DIMMs, so this is still single DIMM per channel. When I went up to two DIMMs per channel, it was pretty much the same story as AM5. Intel was not really significantly better, just a little better, but not dramatically better. I don't wanna to get too far off track because a lot of people on our forum were curious about the homogenous 16 core platform. And so this is really a deeper dive on the AM5 side of things. But I would be remiss without taking a look at the Intel side of things. And also try this on Intel for the four DIMMs of DDR4, also 128 gigabytes, because I have a DDR4 3600 kit from OLOY I've covered in the past. I remembered it being faster than it was, but it's still, slower than a four DIMM DDR5 configuration. So there are benefits for DDR5. So 
AMD has been accurate with their specifications. It's just that I've noticed that some people in our forum and everywhere else are gung-ho to get 128 gigabytes of memory working. And you can, you totally can. But if you want the highest memory bandwidth and the lowest possible latency, doing that with 128 gigabytes of memory is enough of a challenge and stability nightmare that I don't know if I recommend that if you're gonna use your machine for getting things done and work. I think it's gonna introduce a little instability. Now long-term testing, where long-term is about four days of continuous operation and memory stress testing, 64 gigabytes, DDR5, 6000, 7950X, rock solid stable. Kudos, that's amazing. 128 gigabytes, also stable at 3600. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a look at 128 gigabytes on the AM5 platform. It certainly left me with some questions that maybe are worth investigating. Join me in the forum if you wanna explore this, cause hey, I know there's customers out there that want 128 gigabytes of memory. Well, let's figure out what your options are. But like I say, good news is that the boards, I don't think, are the limitation for AM5 because all of these could do 64 gigabytes of DDR5-6000 as well as 128 gigabytes at the post default. But, you know, going beyond 4000, well, it gets a little sketchy. I think that's still more on the CPU than the board, but there was a little bit of variation. I'm Wendell this Level 1. I'm signing out and you can find me in the Level 1 forums.